from uh, Jacques and your team. Uh, it's your, it's your, and, and your 40 minutes starts now. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start with the introduction. So, on my right hand, um, we've got uh, Gavin Mayring. He's the head of marketing at Sunland Global Investment Solutions. Nice, nice to have you here. Then we've got Sudesh uh, Mahan. He's, the, he's got two roles. He's the CIO and Chief Operating Officer of TransUnion Africa. So looking forward to the discussion. And then we've got Neo. Uh, Neo, uh, how do you pronounce your, your, your surname? Is it cool? It's Kwa. Kwa. Neo Kwa. Kwa with a K. Okay, cool. Neo. So Neo, um, he's the CEO of, of YDD. And YDD stands for the Youth Development Through Investigation and Dissemination of Information. It's a mouthful. Love to hear a bit more. So I think what I would like to do without further ado is just to give each one of you the opportunity to give a little bit of background um, in terms of what you do. And we're obviously going to talk about artificial intelligence. And the topic here is how can you harness AI and improve real-time analytic processing to improve your customer offering. So we're going to address that question, but we're also going to talk about AI more generically uh, as well, applications and topical things. And we also want to open it up to uh, the people as well, so the audience. If you've got any questions, uh, we're actually going to go to the audience uh, fairly quickly to keep it very interactive. Um, so during my talk, there was no time for questions as well. So we've got 40 minutes, so we want to actually allow you to ask questions and. We've got some very knowledgeable people up here in investment and credit risk, and they're not only in credit, TransUnion is doing a lot of things as well, and then also youth development. So, Gavin, let's fire away. Good morning. Good morning, morning everybody. Uh, good to be here. Uh, I look after the marketing for Sunlight Global Investment Solutions, um, and one wouldn't think Sunlight being a 100 year old African company could be involved in artificial intelligence, but we were the world's first company to, lo to launch an artificial intelligence fund. Uh, we don't invest in artificial intelligence. We actually have non-humans managing our money, and we have been doing that since 2017. So we believe it's in a, we're in a very exciting space, specifically around its application to try and provide smoother investment outcomes for our investors. I'll be talking about it uh, the next session if I'm not mistaken. But it's all about utilizing the data that is available and the increasing speed at which the data becomes available to produce a um, smoother investment journey for, for, our, for our customers. Um, I invested into the data. So we're the world's first to do it. Um, won several awards internationally, so we're very, very excited about it. And we believe that it's probably going to be the, the way of investing in the next five, ten years. So. Uh, we, we, we are a unique player in the market at the moment, but in 10 years it's going to become a very crowded space. Sure. Sirish, so. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Sirish Mon. I'm the uh, CIO and COO for TransUnion Africa. TransUnion is a uh, global um, credit risk uh, organization involving many other things these days. We, we live for the title of saying information for good, right? And what we're trying to do with that information is drive financial inclusion in 33 countries globally. So if I had to give a stat, just give it to someone earlier, we have twice the amount of information that Facebook has. Right? And that's a massive amount of current data that exists in the world. And we use that to drive solutions into many of the markets that we exist in. So if you think about Africa, we are in South Africa and seven other African nations. Uh, and uh, my job primarily is making sure that we optimize our business and optimizing a data business largely has to do these days with <coughs> machine learning and AI capabilities in that business to drive up insights for businesses and the consumers that we serve. New. Yes. Why did he? Hi. Um, I am now Kwaho. And uh, I run a company called YDD, and we are focused on ad tech, right? Um, using technology to develop youth. Um, we've done, we've been doing this for about now. This is our tenth year. We started in 2009, 
and initially it was just to make sure that young people could access information about opportunities in entrepreneurship, um, career development, as well as education. And over time, we became a, a place where young people could come and uh, consult uh, in terms of their career ambitions. And um, some of the work that we've done includes doing some consultative work with the U.S. Uh, government, uh, where we were part of, I was part of a delegation um, that traversed uh, a couple of uh, states in the U.S., assessing social entrepreneurship and also just uh, giving feedback and compiling analysis, doing analysis and compiling reports on how, you know, what we could learn in Africa and what we could bring back home, and as well as saying, you could really do this. Over the years, obviously, um, we've uh, looked very much at the situation of South Africa, whereas young people are sitting with degrees, and unfortunately, they only know the material that is in the degrees. And nowadays, the jobs that are out there, or careers that are out there, they need them to be multifaceted, especially in terms of uh, the fourth industrial revolution, AI, and so forth. And uh, we basically intervene in that space to help young people to learn the types of skills they need to learn in order to be competitive and to be, you know, appealing to not only the South African market, to the global market. And um, our most recent project where we took 50 young people with just degrees they couldn't find jobs and we put them through an intensive project <coughs> of, uh, you know, digital literacy where literally we taught them how to create a website within a week, you know. Um, so finding solutions really to create the type of young person that can compete globally. Awesome. That's our space. Awesome. We're going to unpack it a little more. Thanks, Mio. Gavin, yes. just quickly, um, in terms of, clearly, you talked about the AI fund. Um, so there's clear application where AI is, is doing the training. But if you can explain a little bit more about um, what well, our AI is being utilized there, not the technical details necessarily, but just our AI is being utilized. And I'm also thinking about, um, because we're also into that space, we actually talk up front as well, um, I'm also thinking about your customers as well. Um, AI applications in regards to customer offerings and how you deal with, with that as well. And what is good for what customer in terms of what you, what you provide? Yeah, um, well thanks, I don't want to steal what Thunder of Mark present next. Yeah. Um, but, but high level, um, in the investments markets globally, um, with millions and millions of dollars flowing into, into stocks and shares on a daily basis, 60% um, of all new flows in America go into ETFs, um, traded funds. These are just tracker funds that follow the stock markets, the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, and they just follow them and they buy and sell according to a list. So it's all computer generated. <coughs> And that 60% of flows is not going into there because the S&P or the Dow Jones are doing particularly well. It's unfortunately that active fund managers, people, human beings who are managing the funds on behalf of their customers have been underperforming the markets. And the reason why you underperform the markets is simple, it's because of human biases and emotions. Um, no matter what people try and tell you, try and explain it away, they always talk about, you know, we, we remove ourselves and we it's very analytical the way we um, approach our stock selection and um, our company um, investigations. But people are swayed by uh, flipping comments or uh, a, a, a wink and a smile from the CEO at the end of the day. And that, that's how your, your investments are, are, are being managed. So people are, are being underserviced in the markets at the moment and they are moving to electronic or digital um, platforms to get the, the returns on their investments. So we had a long, hard look at it. We said, these are the challenges in the market. There's too much information floating around at the end of the day. So how do we manage customer expectations or the, the, lack, of, um, the lack of service and, and delivery at the end of the day with increasing speeds of information and, and um, the amount of information that's being um, produced, marry them together and find a technology or a system that can best service their needs at the end of the day, give them that investment journey that they're looking for. Um, we started with um, 
systematic overviews, complex algos, etc., etc. But we found that using an AI and machine learning overlay, we've managed to uh, provide a service and a system that is able to give our customers that much needed return on their investment at the end of the day. Fantastic. Oh, are you uh, just? Are you also deploying robo advisors, looking at those type of things as well? Intelligent virtual assistant robo advisors. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Um, but it's on the roadmap, or not? <laughs> well, I think the, the, the technology is, is there. I mean, it's um, a lot of the robo advice technologies that are available. Some yeah. Chatbots, yeah. simple decision trees. Yes. Know, if this, yeah. Then that. Um, and it doesn't. The, the AI at the end of the day doesn't. Um, embrace all the things that a good financial advisor would embrace. Um, people invest their money because of a hope and a dream. Yeah. Um, artificial intelligence can replicate anything that requires human thought, and it does that very, very well. Yeah. But artificial intelligence fails dismally on anything that requires non-human thought. So any emotional-based decision, AI technology isn't, isn't there at the moment. So, so when people want to invest money, they invest for a long-term outcome, a retirement, a holiday, putting their kids through university. Those are hopes and dreams. And financial, human being financial advisors are that should be there to assist them to achieve those hopes and dreams. Yep. And we believe that we're using the technology at the back end to provide the necessary yep. outcome for people to get to, um, to that. So the robo advice is very, um, decision tree at the end of the day, we don't think it has the, the functionality or the, um, the, the required outputs to yep. provide the, the most optimal service to human beings at the end of the day. Great. I'd um, love to have further discussion with you on that. Um, Suresh, um, I know you sit with TransUnion in Africa on incredible amounts of data uh, as well. So um, if you can maybe just talk about the types of data that you've got available and, and also how do you think about AI applications around that. Um, to our struggle to obviously, I don't want to turn this into our marketing or transfer data. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. I think there's government data that comes that is mandated by yes. the, uh, the regulators in the country. And we have uh, 25 million consumer records of payment profile data. Right? So when you buy something in a store, when you, when you buy something through a bank, we generally get that data and we able to create a credit profile around that. Additionally, TransUnion has uh, the largest auto uh, database in the country. We also have something called EIR, which is your telephone hand, uh, handsets that you, that you have with you. Who owns that? We have geolocation data, tenant data, landlord data, that type of thing. Right? Wow. It's a massive amount of data that we keep that we then build solutions off of uh, from. Right? Now, in, in, a, in, in our organization, you use that for a couple of things. The one is you use AI when the data comes in to make sure that the data is credible, yeah. right? And there's no bias built into that data. You then feed that into product and different elements of that data then creates a product and allows people to use it for marketing services to target certain group of people. We have 10,000 uh, customers in the country that use that data to give you credit when you buy something. But you'll find that in a mainstream market like South Africa, there are 20, uh, I mentioned 25 million, but there's, there's, there's still 40 million people in the country who don't have access to credit. But those people are using uh, money to pay for rent, for example. And if you find that alternate source, source, sources of data, your ability to find new people to market to and include those people in the formal financial system increases. So due to the amount of data that we have using these types of capabilities and, and machine learning to sort of that data, we are able to then predict what the next set of people to be included in our markets are and that type of thing. Awesome. I, I maybe just want to make a quick comment there as well. I, I mentioned before um, uh, before I started founded Cortex Logic, I was and I sold my first AI company to General Electric, but then I joined after a year company called Juma. And why Juma, Juma is interesting, Juma didn't have the data that TransUnion has got, but it was actually showing, you talked about the, the unbanked, yeah. but just via uh, feature phones, having the ability to, to obviously access the wallet data, and then also the CDR, the call direct record data, 
uh, what we did was to actually build up credit risk and affordability models utilizing that. Now, as people pay back, because it says micro loans, you actually get more information and you can in very, very quick fashion start getting more and more predictive around people, their yeah. behavior and stuff. And so the mobile operator data is also interesting, but it sounds like you've got also access. So we've got access to, to, to that type of data, also awesome. highly governed data, so maybe very clear about that. Yes. But uh, sure. yeah, we do have access to it. Yeah. Just to pick on your point, I uh, was recently in Kigali, Rwanda, and a great uh, case of the central bank uh, getting student loans recorded and making sure that they record them from a very young age and the ability to pay back and the consistency in which it's paid back allows them to create a profile of that person to then give them loans later on. Uh, and so this, and, and what's, what's fascinating about it is it's starting at a very early age. Yeah. Like if you're like nine, ten years old, they started to build a credit profile up for many, many years so that they see eight, when you turn 18, you can then become a, uh, a, uh, a customer to the bank. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Just, just think about the dynamic nature. People will go through various stages of their life. And normally when you think about career, here yeah, you are, but this is interesting. It's a view from when you're young, you're young. You're young. You're young. Yeah. and you already see interesting patterns there, but we might change later on, but yeah, it's, that's interesting. The whole dynamic part of it. Um, Mio, um, yeah. so education is, is also, Close to my heart, I'm, 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 I think it's so important for Africa to transform Africa. Uh, we need to leapfrog, we need to think out of the box in terms of education. So I'd love to, 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 to see what YDD is doing in that regard. We need a lot more of these type of things. How, how do you think about, um, are, are there any, I know you want to get them up to speed with smart technology and just digitalization and stuff, but how do you think about artificial intelligence and maybe exposing so people to that as well. Or is that part of the roadmap? How do you see it? I know it's a three-month course mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So Maybe it's early, but you want, you want to create awareness. It's early stages at the yeah. moment. But we are working off a premise that out of a lot of industries where we've seen innovation in terms of artificial intelligence and you know uh, new IT, um, education has not really transformed um, to keep up with industry demands. Yep. And our space is, our, our focus is to say, all right, fine, why has education not transformed? You know, anything new, we saw, we went through the camps, we went through the OB, we used to call it the OB syllabus, so what? Yep. And all of those took time to come in, but by the time government puts in a new, you know, a, a strategy or a new way of doing things, at that time it's a bit, a tad bit too late, yeah. you know, because technology is constantly changing, it's constantly transforming. So what we then spend time doing, we spend time looking at what are the key things that we need to be focused on in terms of being able to deliver education and for learning to happen in the rapid pace that technology keeps transforming you know yeah. and we were led to some lessons and some teachings whereby uh, through working with uh, some uh, uh, doctors and uh, professors at Stanford University the likes of William Bill McCain and so forth opening up these doors who have been doing research along the lines of the future of learning some of the things that we had to really be honest about the findings that came across was that while everything has been changing, so has the human being's way of learning been changing. Because now if you look at um, young people, you look at uh, you know, how young people learn, they are more apt at picking up a game and running with it so fast, right? And you don't have to be there to teach them how to play this game. You can, they can introduce themselves to new technology. And what we started noticing, we started noticing that um, you don't necessarily, when you try and intervene and force somebody to learn something new, it becomes a challenge. They don't learn it quite as much as they supposed to. But when they have a genuine interest in something, their learning happens very, very rapidly. So our program is designed to specifically 
help young people or help people to be able to learn rapidly, right? So instead of us focusing, when I said we taught young people how to create a website and they didn't have a background in you know, technology or working on the computer, how to create a website within a week, our focus in terms of teaching them did not necessarily set or lie in the material and say this is what you have to cram into your head. What we rather focused on, we focused on giving them results yes. to learn this. Yeah. And we realized that once you give the human being or any person a good enough reason that talks to their ambitions, and you focus a lot more on that and you say, in order for you to find the job that you want, in order for you to be able to create the kind of stuff that you want and be successful at it, this is what you have to learn. And we spend far less time dictating to the lens in terms of what is a PHP script, how do you code, how do you put together an algorithm, and we spend more time showing them what they needed to know in order for them to achieve the things that they needed to achieve, right? And that was a great success because a lot of these young people then went on to now start learning how to add um, things like AdSense into their websites and so forth, right? And before we knew it, these kids had already then started creating websites for their friends uh, who, have, who have started small businesses and so forth, right? And from then on, some of them started coming back to us to say, hey, look, I've earned $100 yep. from AdSense. So some of them were real came back to us to say, I don't think I need to go and find a job. I am now in a position, a if, if, I were, if I were to scale this, yeah. I'm now in a position where yeah. I'm earning money every single month yeah. by being able to do that. And that's where we saw that we have not tapped enough as a country through our education system to say our biggest challenge is an employment, is unemployment, and the earning potential for any young person that cannot find a job, right? Yep. And as a country, we have not tapped enough <coughs> into the potential for anybody to learn the required type of skill sitting at home to can be able to put in those features that need to be put in and for them to actually be able to start earning money online. Yep. And here, I'm not talking about Forex and so forth, because many people talk Forex, we think scams, right? A lot of times. I've been scammed through a forex, <laughs> you understand? Yeah. But here it's giving young people practical tools to say, while you are looking for a job, here is an alternative. So here we are focused on, we will not find you a job. We will not put you into a job. What we will do is we will give you the kind of digital skills that can earn you an income. That's awesome. I, I think I love the end to end and making it practical and real. And maybe that's a solution because if you think about Education in general, it's we don't. I think the outcomes are so important. It's almost like when we when we do AI, uh, uh, operationalizing AI for businesses. You always think about the business value drivers. What's the end game? What are you trying to achieve here? What's the outcomes? It's very nice, good to be outcome focused. Just put in terms of education, if you look at the 21st century skills, the 16 skills, apart from the foundational literacies. Two other ones that's been identified is uh, dealing with changing environments and dealing with complex environments. And, and actually, um, because of the reasons and the problem that you frame, you actually, it's, it is creativity, there's problem thinking, you, you're always setting them up, so I love that. So I think it's making it real and practical. We maybe, we, we, I think we need to get this into schools. And so my, my other comment was just around, um, I, th I think the, the big thing is we need to scale this. So you talk about how many students? Well, look, we did the project with uh, 50 young people. That's great. That's, you see that's 50 of them, all right? And initially how this came about was because I created a website myself, yeah. right? For my own company, you know? And uh, I just decided, you know what? I'm just going to put in a couple of AdSense at that very, very simple thing, right? And within six months, I got a check from Google for just a little over 6,000 rand. Now, the work to do that, the time it took me to create a site and launch it and put in those things, it took me about two days, right? 
And it was just two days of work, and maybe once a week updating the site with content. It didn't even take up much of my time, yep. right? And then I forgot about it. And then one day, while I was just minding my business, an email comes in and Google says, we are unable to pay you your money. So what, oh, I, and then the next thought was, can you imagine if you were to teach every young person how to do this in the country? Build a site, this is how you include accents into it, and then where do we get those clients who need websites? We can go to the CIPC. You've got a database of businesses yeah. that possibly don't have websites. Distribute these uh, businesses to these young people, right? And these young people build sites. You could actually scale this to a point where the frequency of the money coming in, sitting at about 6,000 rand, can move from six months and it, come, it can come as close as up to every month or as close as up to every second month. Yeah. Then you have really taken care of a really big problem. Now the young people can really focus on what they really would love to pursue. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Okay, so um, I think part of the scaling, and uh, this is where it becomes potentially debatable, because I think Gavin, you mentioned also that um, can AI really embrace or deal with the emotional aspects um, as well? And it gets interesting. I think one what you can think about what you can do now with video and audio and then sentiment and, and information that you can get just from looking at cameras, just looking at individuals. Um, what we should underestimate what one can do there. The reason I mentioned that from an educational perspective, I think we'll see AI um, also being one of the key technologies to actually help with scale. If you think about personalized tutors um, and to crack that, we haven't cracked that yet, um, that problem um, yet, but, but it's uh, the tools are there. I can tell you now the technology, these breakthroughs every month, every quarter. So we stay in touch with state of the art <coughs> fronts. And uh, it's very exciting. So we talked about, I mentioned in my talk, also the exponential curves, linear. So don't be surprised if you've got C systems in education and maybe even intelligent virtual assistants, robot advisors, where you see empathy build in for something. Uh, so, so I think it's coming. So maybe, but, but uh, so it's going to be interesting. So, but it's the man machine intelligence continuum, how we play with that. I want to also open it up to, is there any questions from the audience as well? Yes. I have two questions. One to Neil. Neil, he did you uh, separate, right? He offered, he actually said that he will give students who want to go to university at Stanford, he'd rather let them stop going to university for three years and pay them to do their startups. Now, you've done something similar in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any way maybe we can get see, uh, angel funders to do that and help these students? I, I, you know, when I did this, I mean, uh, I was just building, more than anything else was to build a case so that I can present actual evidence of work. You know, it's very easy to, to, to walk in and talk really good and uh, sound like uh, your idea will actually work. So right now I'm at a point where I am looking to actually scale this project, all right, to as many as possible young people to say, listen, Within three months, because one of the things we've been able to, 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 to get right is rapid learning, all right? So normally, if you're thinking about um, going to do a course to learn um, you know, how to develop websites and just a little bit more advanced, and you start adding some intelligence in there, you're looking at about doing a course for up to six months. But you understand that if we could just teach young people within a week how to create a basic website. So that's the number one thing is we know that we can train them and we can train them really quick. And within a period of three months, they are ready to go out there and start implementing this. So I am definitely looking for companies or any, any funders that can come aboard and say, look, here's 100 learners because we've got the training right, we know how to scale. We just need the money to do it. Awesome. You have a second question? Yeah. The second question is, with that, uh, we have a problem with global, not global sound. Yes. Now, uh, Professor, uh, I think Sweeney from Harvard did the test on racial bias and gender bias with AI. Yes. Yeah, so we need to also be, we have to consider global south country you know, the issues with racial biases and uh, gender biases. So, are we looking to... 
Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think it's very important. Unfortunately, I couldn't get to that in my talk because I actually have a few slides on trustworthy AI and, and um, those type of things comes comes with like ethics values. And there's also the future of life. I think last year I participated in a conference with Max at TechMark, my team professor at Life 3.0, and they were talking about killer these autonomous weapons or killer robots. Um, and the day before it was nuclear. Um, and and, and and, uh, but anyway, so they, in 2017, they had a conference at a uh, I think it was, was at the Sudimar, and they called it AI, uh, Sudimar's AI Principles. It's 23 pen principles. The bulk of that is about ethics and, 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 and policies and stuff. And I just saw the European Union came out with a report, which was shared on LinkedIn as well. So I'm definitely seeing that. So the question is now, and what basically in that report, they're also talking about how do you operationalize it? How do you bring it? What does it mean for your AI solutions and systems? So, which is great. We're on the right track. Um, so um, in terms of global, local, I think we're part of the global community. We need to adhere to um, those kind of solutions. Data privacy, all of it is relevant. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. what's it? Yeah, maybe one of the things that you find in the current risk, uh, if you looked at people getting credit, is the explainability of the AI. Uh, when, when you are working with individuals who you, know, you can make or break, whether they take a loan and how they judge, uh, what is critical for us is making sure that whatever bias exists in the system, we, we clean out. And that we are able to explain the AI is just not, we're not allowed to put stuff into a black box that comes out the other side with the results need to make sure that there's, there's proper explainability. That's one of our biggest challenges. And this is interesting as well because um, if you think about how you train the system, so you can set up that bias in terms of, do you have representative data? The problem yeah. is, if you don't have, see, even if you look at gender, say gender for instance, you can look at race and all sorts of things, but if you look at gender and you don't have enough representative examples of, say, women, that actually it has got a good credit risk, then the system is going to be biased. Exactly. And and so what you want to do is you, this is this thing this this stuff that data scientists can actually do. You can build in systems to be more representative, and you can build systems that will you take that bias out. But it's a huge responsibility because it's it's in the hand of data scientists. So we need transparency in terms of the whole process of model building. Exactly. <laughs> Governing, governing there. I don't think I've got any I mean, yeah. corporate governance is one of my, yeah. uh, my, my loves. I'm, I'm yeah. doing a PhD on it. But um, I mean, it starts, if you're looking at artificial intelligence, and I mean, this is, we're going to go on a quick journey in my, little, in my mind here. So you have, you have a chatbot. You have a company that has a chatbot. Yeah. The chatbot can speak all, all, our, all our official languages, and depending on the type of customer that goes through, can be male or female or gender neutral, depending on what your your preferences are. Because of the AI technology, we can be very profiled the caller as he's coming through. Now, in order to have your chatbots working properly and to represent your company efficiently, you've got to build in your company vision and mission uh, principles, what it can and cannot say, give a full scope of uh, of, of its allowed. Um, principles and, and discussion points, much like you're employing um, a real human being, a, a staff member. Now, say you, you, your phone's through, you're speaking with your chatbots, and then all of a sudden, there's a glitch in the system, and it goes off the rails. Me, the customer, I phone the head office, and I say, listen, I was speaking to John, and John was speaking to me, and he told me to go wherever, and I find it totally unacceptable. As a company, you cannot turn around and say, sorry, that was a machine that is a representative of your organization. True. And because they're a representative of the organization, suddenly some ethical questions yes. start arising. Do you, you know, as a, are they therefore deemed as virtual staff members? Are they entitled to leave? What kind of, uh, what, what, what kind of privileges do they get? Because, and how do you reprimand them? Do you just take them offline and turn them off, or do you send them for counseling and for, um, <laughs> And for some rework, so they can come back into the system. Then, how does it affect your BE scorecard? Because I suddenly I've got one person who's speaking all official, all the official languages. They can be black, they can be white, they can be Chinese, they can be speaking Sutu, Toza. And how are they um, measured on on that aspect? How how is each one? Do we have to pay them 
and I mean, we started to go down a very, very slippery slope um, that I don't think a lot of people have fully unpacked. But the exciting thing about it, with all this technology, I believe, is that if we have a look at it and we take a step back and we say, artificial intelligence is here, the technology is here, and it gives us the opportunity to get more in touch with our own humanity. Because by getting in touch with our humanity, the technology is going to be there to serve us and serve us properly, as opposed to us serving it. Awesome, I fully agree with that. In, uh, we've got only like two minutes left. Is there any other questions uh, from the audience? Yes. For the, the companies that are implementing AI, are they going to the hyperscalers, the Amazons, and the Zeros of the world? Or would that typically be in house? You know, would that hardware going on the own data center? Or, you know, how would most guys approach that? Yeah, that's interesting. So Cortex Logic, my company, uh, we're an agent for business and we are very flexible in that regard. So we are we've got partners with Microsoft, Google, and AWS, Azure as well. If the customer has got a preference, say for Microsoft Azure uh, or Google, then we can build solutions in the, in the cloud. So if they want a cloud-based kind of solutions, but if they want on-premise solutions, we can deploy there as well. It doesn't need to be them. So it depends on uh, where we're going super flexible. You can have even a, a, a private cloud solutions. Just to give you an example as well, there's also, you need to look at the use case. In some instances, say you want to do, with have got an AI vision product, for instance. You don't want to take all that video to the cloud necessarily. You want, you want to actually handle it on site with all the video cameras. You want to deploy a solution that sits there. There's many uh, other situations where you want to deploy uh, say a vision solution that sits in a truck in a camera that look at people, maybe fatigue, do you have a seat belt on, uh, is there distractions, uh, those type of things, especially for vehicle tracking companies as well. So those kind of deployments is in right there, in, on the edge. So it, it, it varies, depends on the application. I don't know if you guys want to comment on yeah. that. Uh, I think the, uh, it depends on the industry. It is. Because of the level of personal information that we store in our organization, we are unable to Today. If an Amazon were to open up here next year, uh, with next year, I think we'll think about the journey. But for right now, everything is based on the nature of the data. Awesome. I think, uh, is that, do you have, Melvin, one question or we're done? Um, maybe one more question. One more question. Sum it up. Uh, any question on the floor? Any, any more questions? Okay. Okay, cool. Global South and the Global North. Because we implement the global, global, global North. What, the Global North? Yeah, and the Global South. We cannot interface the system that they need to South Africa or the Southern Global South countries with the ease bias that's on there. Well, no, that's true. So so that's why we need to build Africa's African solution for Africans as well. Uh, and and, and we, we are doing that. So we're comparing even with the state of the art APIs, commercial APIs that's available. And we've got proprietary APIs. Uh, we build solutions here. And if you think about African languages as well, I mean, currently it's not properly supported by big tech players. So, yeah. Although Google is quite good with their languages and stuff. But yeah. Great. I think that's it. So thank you to the audience, uh, to, to, to the panelists. It was great to talking to you. And uh, thanks to the audience as well for your questions as well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.